Hey there guys, Paul here from TheEngineeringMindset.com. In this video, we're going to be learning how refrigerants work in HVAC systems. Now to become a HVAC engineer, it is absolutely essential you understand how the refrigerant works, how it changes phases and how it moves thermal energy around the system. Guys, I'd just like to take a moment to thank Danfoss, our sponsor for today's episode. Danfoss is your go-to source for information and resources that can help you through the cooling industry's transition to natural and climate-friendly refrigerants. They have a deep understanding of all the new regulations and their effects, and they're ready to share their knowledge and solutions with you. They've also made helpful tools like the Refrigerant Retrofit Guide, the Low GWP tool, and also the Cool Selector 2 app, which is available for free on their website. You can access them now by visiting refrigerants.danfoss.com. All right, so jumping into the video, now it doesn't matter what type of system you look at, all the way from uh, the refrigerator in your home to simple split units and even large industrial chillers. Essentially, they all work the same. And that's because they pass the refrigerant between the main components of the evaporator, the compressor, the condenser, and the expansion device. When we say refrigerant, what we mean is a fluid that can be easily boiled from a liquid into a vapor and also be condensed from a vapor back into a liquid. And this needs to be able to occur again and again and again without failure. So what is used as a refrigerant? Well, we could use water, that will work, and it is used in absorption chillers. Now, if you haven't watched our video on absorption chillers, and I highly recommend you do so, we've got, also got a lot of other interesting videos such as air-cooled chillers and uh, just general uh, HVAC uh, building services videos. So do check these out when you get a moment. But the reason we don't typically use water in common refrigeration units is because they are specially made refrigerants designed specifically for the task of these. And so they're able to perform much better. On the screen, you'll see some of the more common refrigerants that are used currently. And that is R22, R134A and R410A. If you don't know what these R numbers mean, then don't worry, we're gonna be looking at the different types of refrigerant in the next video, along with the pros and cons of them, especially their potential impact on the environment. But as, as you can see on the screen, these refrigerants have extremely low boiling points compared to water. So they need very little heat in order to boil and evaporate into a vapor. And this means they can extract heat more rapidly. You can see that at atmospheric pressure, then the boiling portal point of water is 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit, but uh, R134A has a boiling point of just minus 26.3 degrees Celsius or minus 15.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can use room temperature to boil these and take the heat away from the room and uh, disperse that out to the atmosphere. But for now, let's see how the refrigerants actually move around the system. So we'll start with the compressor because it's the driving force of the refrigerant pushing it around the system. And there's a lot of different types of compressors, but in this video, we're gonna just look at this basic piston type, just to make it very clear and easy to understand how it works. So the refrigerant is entering into the compressor as a saturated vapor, and it's at a low temperature and low pressure. The compressor pulls the refrigerant in and rapidly compresses it. This forces the molecules together, so the same amount of molecules fit into a smaller space. This increases the collision rate of the molecules because they are all constantly bouncing around. As they collide, they convert their kinetic energy into heat. At the same time, all the energy that is put in by the compressor is converted into internal energy within the refrigerant. This results in the refrigerant increasing in internal energy, enthalpy, temperature and pressure. And you'll know this if you've ever used a bike pump, the pump gets very hot as the pressure increases. The refrigerant now comes from the compressor around into the condenser. The condenser is where all the unwanted heat is rejected out into the atmosphere. This will include all the heat from the building as well as the heat from the compressor. When the refrigerant enters the condenser, it needs to be at a higher temperature than the air around it in order for the heat to transfer. The greater the temperature difference, the easier the heat transfer will be. The refrigerant enters as a superheated vapor at high pressure and high temperature, and it passes along the tubes of the condenser. Fans will blow air across the condenser to remove the heat, just like you might blow on a hot spoon of soup to cool it down. As the air blows across the tubes, it removes the thermal energy 
from the refrigerant. As the refrigerant gives up this heat, it will condense into a liquid, so by the time the refrigerant leaves the condenser, it will be a completely saturated liquid, still at a higher pressure, but ever so slightly cooler, although its enthalpy and entropy will have decreased. Now you'll see this if you pour boiling water into a, a glass. Uh, you'll see all the steam start to rise out of it, and also the steam as it comes into contact with the glass, which is at a cooler temperature, it will condense and that steam will then form a, a vapor. And that will then, as it condenses, it will then roll down and make its way into the bottom of the glass again, back into a liquid. Next, a refrigerant makes its way from the condenser around and into the expansion device. In this case, we've got a thermal expansion valve. The expansion valve meters the flow of refrigerant into the evaporator, and in this example we're using a thermal expansion valve which uses a capillary bulb to control the flow through the valve depending on the temperature at the outlet of the evaporator. The valve is a bit like a spray nozzle. It has a high pressure on one side within the bottle, and there's a low pressure side just past the nozzle. When the trigger is squeezed it lets the fluid pass, and this will be a mixture of liquid and vapor. So as the refrigerant passes through the expansion valve, it will do just this and it will expand because the pipework after it going into the evaporator is at a lower pressure so the refrigerant will be able to expand to fill this. As it expands it reduces in pressure and temperature. Just like if you hold a deodorant can or a spray paint can and you press the nozzle, you'll feel it get colder and the walls of the container uh, will become less pressurized as you do so. So the refrigerant will leave the expansion valve at, at a, uh, a low pressure and temperature and it now heads straight into the evaporator. The evaporator receives the refrigerant and a fan blows the warm air across the coils. The temperature of the air must be higher than the temperature of the cool refrigerant and this allows it to absorb more energy and to boil the refrigerant completely into a vapor, much like heating a pan of water. The heat will cause the water to evaporate into steam vapor, and the vapor will carry away the heat. If you place your hand over the steam uh, of the pan, then you'll find it is really hot. So please don't do that at home. And remember, the refrigerants have very low boiling points, so the room temperature air is enough to boil it into a vapor. The refrigerant leaves as a saturated vapor at a low pressure and temperature. The temperature only changes slightly, which confuses many people, but the reason it does not increase is because it's undergoing a phase change from a liquid to a vapor. So the thermal energy is being used to break the bonds between the molecules, but their enthalpy and entropy will increase, and this is where the energy is going. The temperature will only change once the fluid is no undergoing a phase change. Alright guys, that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that and it helped you. Just before we go, I'd like to say one more quick thanks to Danfoss for sponsoring this episode and remind you to check out their free refrigerant resources available at refrigerants.danfoss.com.